Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kareem Taufik. I'm an assistant professor here at Vanderbilt. Um, I just joined the faculty here in August after having completed uh, medical school at NYU, my residency at University of Cincinnati, and then a two-year neurotology fellowship at UCSD. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Thanks for attending this course. Um, I'm sorry that we can't meet you all in person, but I want to talk to you today uh, about a couple things. My first talk will be about endoscopic ear surgery, and then I'll give you a separate talk about the middle of fossa approach. So let's first talk about endoscopic ear surgery. I have no disclosures. Really, uh, binocular microscopy was first introduced in the world of otology in the 1950s. And we've, of course, continued to do, use binocular microscopy ever since. It wasn't until the 1990s, uh, really around the time that end endoscopes became prevalent uh, for uh, sinus surgery, that the uh, otologists started to use them as adjunctive um, means of dissection in, uh, for, for ear surgery. So as you all know, endoscopes uh, have uh, various, endoscopes have various roles across subdisciplines in our field, um, facial plastics, sinus surgery, thyroid surgery even. Um, and in some, dis some respects, it's uh, widely known that the endoscopes, endoscopes, especially for sinus surgery, for instance, provide real value in uh, mitigating morbidity and um, improving visualization of, of uh, the anterior skull base and the sinonasal anatomy. But I wanna ask you the question and hopefully I'll answer the question for you. Does it add value? Does endoscopy add value in the realm of ear surgery? <clears throat> Theoretically, we hope it does, right? The, uh, this schematic sort of shows you um, the, the field of view that you can achieve by looking down the barrel of the ear canal with a microscope versus the field of view that you can see with an endoscope. And the, the point of this is to show you that you're limited uh, by the ear canal anatomy when you're looking down the barrel of, uh, of uh, the canal with a, with a microscope. And you can certainly bypass um, any, uh, any um, obstacles that the ear canal presents to you using the endoscope because the tip of the endoscope can simply be placed distal to uh, any obstruction. So this is an example of what I'm talking about. So there's a microscopic view of a right ear with a tympanic membrane perforation, the ex anterior extent of which you can't really see thanks to this anterior canal bulge. And we've all seen this in clinic uh, in the operating room before. But you know, that said, there, that's not to say that there aren't real advantages to using a microscope. You get a high quality image, you get excellent depth of field thanks to its binocular uh, nature, and you can use two hands to dissect. Um, the cons, as we discussed, the anatomy can sometimes be limiting. And if you think about the procedures that we do in otology to uh, achieve exposure, they're all designed to, to see middle ear res recesses that you can't see otherwise. We drill uh, into the zygomatic root during a mastoidectomy so we can see the epi epitympanum. With an endoscope, however, you can see those structures quite readily. Um, and I wanna show you this, I want this, this picture sort of exemplifies for you the difference in the field of view that you get with a microscope versus an endoscope. Obviously, oh, in my opinion, the, uh, the uh, picture on the right is, is, is a little bit more um, uh, friendly. Um, so <clears throat> the advantages to the endoscopic view, easy access to the middle ear recesses. You don't have to make a postauricular incision to get there, less drilling. Uh, the cons are that you, you have to use one hand to dissect. You're, you're, you're using one hand to hold the endoscope and the other to dissect. Therefore, blood is a nuance, it's a nuisance rather, and um, it's difficult. To, it can be difficult to manage, especially if you have very inflamed ear, uh, you didn't get a good injection at the beginning of the case. <clears throat> Compromised depth of field, some authors will talk about this as a limitation, but pra practically speaking, I don't think it's a, a limitation at all. Um, we've uh, certainly learned to overcome any compromised depth of field when we learn to do en uh, endoscopic sinus surgery, and I think, I think the same is, is true of doing endoscopic ear surgery. <clears throat> Retrotympanic anatomy is something that you can see with an endoscope, but you can't see with a microscope unless you do a lot of drilling to try to get there. And this picture, these four panels just illustrate for you the differences in the sinus, sinus tympani anatomy. Uh, um, the, uh, these four panels are different variations in the sinus tympani anatomy. And this is anatomy that you, you would never really get to see 
uh, uh, looking down the barrel of an ear canal with a microscope. <clears throat> So the anatomy of the sinus tympani is dictated by a variety of um, spicules of bone. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, but suffice it to say that this anatomy and the variations of the anatomy have a bearing on the way cholesteatoma spreads in the, in the retro tympanum. And that can be useful for you to know as a surgeon going in, uh, or, or rather in the operating room when you're dissecting. And you can see this stuff. Uh, you can see this anatomy with an angled endoscope. <laughs> Here's a, a, a left ear um, showing you the sinus tympani bordered superiorly by the ponticulus and inferiorly by the subiculum. This is the stapes and stapedial tendon, pyramidal eminence. Here's the facial nerve running superiorly, uh, superior to the stapes. Here's the cochlear promontory round window. This is anatomy that you don't get to see with a microscope. And, and this the, the, the variety of views here <clears throat> will show you um, how much more of, the, of that sinus tympani and anatomy you can see when you're rotating a 45 degree endoscope uh, so that it's aimed posteriorly. And this is a paper that effectively says the same thing. This was drafted by uh, my partner, Mark Bennett, <clears throat> uh, who, who's uh, another neurotologist here at Vanderbilt. This paper compared endoscopic and microscopic visualization of the middle ear re recesses uh, using 3D temporal bone reconstructions. So if you look at this image, it's a summary of what the paper says, which is that if you um, that you can see a lot more of the middle ear when you're using an endoscope uh, as compared to a microscope that's positioned so that's looking down the axis of the um, of the external auditory canal. So, in the orange is what you can see with the microscope, um, and the blue is what you can't see. Here with the endoscope, you see much more of the pro tympanum more of the uh, sinus tympani. With angled endoscopes, you can see uh, much more of the epitympanum too, and more of the uh, retro tympanum, pro tympanum. It, it all becomes much more visible. <clears throat> Here's some pro tympanic anatomy. So this is a right ear. This is the bony eustachian tube. Here's the anterior epitympanic space, supertubal recess, if you will. Cochlear form process, that's where the tensor tympani comes out and tensor tympani projects laterally to, uh, um, to attach to the neck of the malleus. Here's just the anterior end of the uh, um, oval window. And here's the cochlear promontory, just to give you a frame of reference. This is anatomy that you, again, you would not be able to see this with a microscope. Observational endoscopy. So when we talk about endoscopic ear surgery techniques, we Sometimes we'll, we'll talk about observational endoscopy and uh, as differentiated from operative endoscopy. Observational endoscopy is what, uh, what uh, historically has been used most commonly, which is using an endoscope as an adjunct to the microscope to look around corners. And <clears throat> this is probably the largest study looking at um, the uh, potential advantages of endoscopy for observational endoscopy for cholesteatoma. Almost 300 years, the endoscope's being used as an adjunct to the microscope. And the authors found that there's about a 15% rate of cholesteatoma that's missed by the microscope, but detected by the endoscope. So they're putting in the endoscope after they've done their microscopic cholesteatoma dissection. They're trying to find out, well, I think I cleared everything, but how often, am I, how often am I missing something with the microscope and picking it up with the endoscope? And it turns out that this, this rate is pretty similar to what you see in other studies that have examined the same question. So what about operative endoscopy? This is where the endoscope is being used uh, as the primary means of visualization and dissection. <clears throat> What's the equipment you need to use to do this? Well, it's just what you're used to using for sinus surgery, you can really actually just use the same equipment that you use for sinus surgery as far as the uh, camera and the Hopkins rod is concerned. <clears throat> um, so the standard otologic instrument sets that we're all used to using for microscopic dissection can be applied to endoscopic surgery as well. But in, uh, for endoscopic surgery, there are some specialized instruments that can be used optionally. Uh, to facilitate dissection around corners. And there's also uh, a specialized instrumentation for elevating uh, tissue, particularly the tympanomedial flap. So this is a uh, suction round knife. I believe Dan Lee from Mass Ioneer develop, helped develop this with uh, Grace Medical. And this is a, a close-up view of the, that round knife tip. It has a suction port just behind the round knife. 
And this helps significantly in um, managing the blood um, uh, during temp tympanomedial flap elevation. Here's some suction, curved suction instrumentation to help you dissect and uh, uh, clear blood from around corners. <clears throat> and this is an image just showing you how I like to set up the room when, when I'm doing these cases. So I like to have the micro wipe positioned right next to the ear so I can clean the, the uh, tip of the endoscope uh, right then and there. I don't have to wait for my scrub to hand over a micro wipe and uh, wipe the tip. It's just all right there. And this uh, green uh, pad has, is impregnated with defog. And I like to have the monitor, you know, uh, close to eye level, so I don't have to torque my neck up or left or right to to see what I need to see, and uh, <clears throat> and that works out pretty well for doing this. So we'll talk about endoscopic tympanoplasty now, and I'll show you some videos. This first video is um, my first endoscopic case that I ever did, and I think I was a fourth year resident uh, when I did this. <clears throat> Uh, it's a cholesteatoma pearl that's being removed from the surface of an eardrum in a patient who's getting a revision uh, tympanoplasty surgery. I think the first operation he had was uh, at an outside hospital. He's got a residual inferior perforation. You can see there's a lot of blood here as I'm elevating this flap. Um, and that, that's certainly one of the disadvantages to using an endoscopic technique. You, you, really, you don't have a non-dominant hand to manage the bleeding. So we're in the middle of the ear now, we're clearing the, uh, we're, try, we're dissecting through mucosal adhesions. There's a stapes, there's a facial nerve. I like to use this technique where you're, you're cutting adhesions and then using the tip of the instrument to push tissue away. <clears throat> Here we're clearing some more adhesions from around the stapes superstructure. And I'm gonna fast forward a bit. Placing a porp. I'm using the under, I still do this, uh, I use the undersurface of the tympanic membrane to help stabilize. One thing I like to do differently now is I'll, I'll actually pack the middle ear before I place the prosthesis. <clears throat> so there you have it, we're packing the middle ear and we're using a biodesign otologic repair graft, which is a manufactured porcine submucosa graft. Um, that's really nice to use for endoscopic ear surgery, for, especially because one of the advantages of this technique is that it avoids a postericular incision. So you don't have to har harvest the patient's own tissue if you don't want to. And these are relatively in inexpensive grafts, but of course the pricing varies between institutions. So this slide I, is a slide I created um, uh, shortly after doing that case. I found that my FES skills were quite transferable I found that the flap elevation was tedious because of the bleeding and that the one-handed dissection was really limiting until I was able to enter the middle ear. Um, because once you enter, enter that middle ear, all that blood has a place to drain. And uh, the port positioning was slow and deliberate. You know, I, it was my first time doing the case, of course, but um, uh, that, that, that disadvantage I thought was offset by the, real, the high quality of the picture, the close-up view of what I was, what I was dissecting. This is, a, this is a picture taken from uh, Grace Medical's uh, brochure of uh, endoscopic instruments. Um, <clears throat> I think Stores also has an endoscopic ear set, but I wanted to show you some of these instruments in action. Um, so here's a video of uh, endoscopic case we recently did. This is a, a suction, suction elevator. It's nice to use for this uh, tympanometal flap elevation. There's, a, you can just see the annulus there. And this is a different suction elevator, a 45 degree elevator that we're using to uh, 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 dislocate the fibrous annulus and enter the middle ear. So this is nice to use because it makes that, that uh, sort of uh, ma managing the bleeding becomes way, way easier with these uh, suction dissection instruments. This patient had IS joint erosion. That's why we did this case in the first place. I, it was actually something you could see through the eardrum when you looked at, at her in, in, uh, in clinics so and she had quite a bit of a conductive loss. So that was the goal of this surgery was to uh, improve her hearing. Here we're placing a, a, a grace bite prosthesis. I like this prosthesis because it, it uh, crimps down on the uh, stapes capitulum. And as I said before, I like to pack the middle ear before I place the uh, prosthesis and I put a dome, uh, a beveled cartilage graft on top of that head. And I'll fast forward to the final product, um, which is shown here. And I like to <clears throat> pack the canal with ointment after these cases. 
So how does it compare to the microscopic technique? This is a meta-analysis of uh, 1,200, almost 1,200 interventions, uh, looking at uh, graph uptake, hearing results, operative times, no cholesteatoma patients here, just simple tympanoplasty for perforations. And uh, the rates of graft uptake, hearing results, operative times were all comparable between endoscopic and microscopic technique. And here's, a, here's sort of a summary slide showing you that uh, the, the closure rates for perforation were very similar between endoscopic and microscopic techniques. So for cholesteatoma, does, it, does endoscopy actually improve long-term outcomes for cholesteatoma? Um, this is a systematic review that tries, tries to, you know, at least document um, the rates of uh, uh, long-term outcomes with endoscopy. So in this study, uh, some patients had totally endoscopic ear surgery. Some patients had a combined approach. All of them had endoscopy as a part of their surgery with a mean follow-up of two years and pretty favorable cholesteatoma rates at that time, point, at that time point. <clears throat> this is a, a, a very current study. This, this came out in this month's laryngoscope, randomized controlled trial, 78 patients, endoscopic group of, um, uh, these, and I should mention these are patients who had adic cholesteatoma, were randomized to have an endoscopic or microscopic surgery. The endoscopic group had shorter operations, less pain. They didn't get any posterior incisions, of course, as compared to the um, microscopic group. Their hearing outcomes, recurrence uh, rates at one year, and their complication rates were very similar uh, to the microscopic group. Conversion to open techniques, meaning a posterior incision to uh, uh, access cholesterol that you just can't access, get to with, a, with an endoscope, that's, that's a real problem. Uh, it does happen. And sometimes we go in doing an, end, uh, uh, an endoscopic case with the, the thought that we might need to convert. And that was definitely the case here with this patient who has a cholesteatoma buried under the eardrum here, posterior superiorly. This is a right ear. So anterior is here, posterior is here. And we thought we might need to convert, but we decided to go and try to clear this endoscopically. So here we're de debulking the uh, cholesteatoma. And here we're digging up into the, uh, toward the additus at antrum, posterior superiorly, I'm using a curved suction. And I just can't get to the end of it. So we ended up con uh, converting to an open technique, but at least we gave them a shot. Um, <clears throat> so is this technique safe? Um, I think the answer is yes, it is safe, but there are some scattered reports of complications that may or may not be due to heat from the endoscope. There's one case as of 2016 anyway, of delayed facial palsy, um, several reports of decrease in sensory neural hearing. This cadaveric study um, <clears throat> shows that temperature elevation as a result of uh, the light, intent, light uh, from the tip of the endoscope is a real concern. And that's shown best here. Um, so 47 degrees uh, temperature with 100% xenon light. Uh, but if you decrease that intensity to 50%, well, that, that intensity goes, uh, that uh, heat uh, decreases significantly. So what we like to do is uh, keep that uh, light intensity to 40% and we avoid holding the endoscope uh, too close to the, uh, to the, um, the, the windows uh, that, uh, between us and the inner ear. I've never seen, I've never had a complication that, that I thought was due to uh, having used an endoscope. I've never seen a delayed fall, uh, facial palsy or an immediate facial palsy for that matter with an endoscopic technique at all. Benefits, so multiple benefits, I think. So patients with short necks, cervical arthritis, improved post-operative pain uh, because you're not having to make an incision. It's an excellent teaching tool and a teaching tool. And if you ask your ancillary staff what they think of it, well, almost always they'll tell you that uh, they they actually prefer scrubbing the endoscopic cases over the microscopic cases. How do you learn this? Well, I think it's easier for those of us who've been trained in FES because of those skills being transferable. And uh, there are a variety of courses out there. Uh, we we have one, so I'm going to give us a, give us ourselves a plug. Um, uh, I'll be uh, directing the endoscopic ear surgery course for us in the spring, and uh, that course will be uh, virtual, if not in person, so I'm going to cross my fingers for an in-person course, but we'll see how things go. And then the other recommendation I, I give to you is to start with easy cases, a simple posterior type 1 tympanoplasty, 
uh, is a nice way to start and then advance um, uh, those endoscopic skills uh, to more difficult cases. Trimming the ear, the ear canal hair is essential for, uh, for frustration mitigation. And a good four quadrant injection at the beginning of the case helps a lot. Keeping the microscope in the operating room is a good idea, especially early on. Um, and uh, I think that the thoughts I wanna, uh, that I hope to leave you with are that endoscopic surgery does give you easy, ready access to the recesses of middle, of middle ear. It's a distinct advantage of this technique. And it's a safe and effective um, technique as well. Outcomes are equivalent uh, really to conventional techniques, uh, particularly, uh, and, and it's, a, it's really a beautiful tool for properly selected patients. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions uh, during the panel at the end of the day.